I'm talking to the longevity group and we're talking about the gym and we're talking about fitness, of course, there's an emphasis on the aesthetic. And I don't mean to discount that because there's something about the aesthetic that correlates with health. That's not my motivation. My motivation is mostly what's going on in between my ears. So what's important to me is keeping my brain working at a high level function for as long as I can so I can enjoy my own grandkids, my own multi-generational <laughs> legacy. To do that, I wanted to start with um, a realization. There's an emerging biohacking community. It's coming through on Twitter. It's coming through on Instagram and other multimedia platforms that have yet to be shut down of people who no longer trust the government for health information and they have good reasons. One of those um, accounts, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Mangan150 on Twitter, he introduced me to somebody else who is a medical doctor and researcher at the Rosemont Institute for Cancer at the University of Buffalo. December 1, he came out with a new paper and he says there's no limit to maximal lifespan in humans. Now, he's thinking hypothetically. You know, for all of us who are alive, I suppose death is just a hypothesis. But he says 122 years is the record and he sees no theoretical limit to um, breaking that record. He doesn't understand why we have to die. He understands the mechanisms of dying, he understands the ways in which we die, but he's not convinced that we have to. And so he wrote this paper, um, which I think is representative of this independent thinking movement about life and wellness that is rejecting the, the standard government line. And for that reason, it encounters a lot of resistance. So the first part of my talk is going to be to try and break down some of the resistance to what I now know are myths about nutrition, myths about sunshine, myths about health and wellness in general. When we chip away at those myths, then we leave room for radical new ideas about what is healthy and about what extends the quality of our life. Because he's a medical doctor, he's thinking about medical interventions. Uh, I'm an engineer. And so I don't prescribe medicine, I don't give, I'm not that kind of doctor, you know, I don't, uh, doctor philosophy, for goodness sakes, I don't give uh, medical advice. I'll tell you about what I read in the library and what's been working for me. The fact is that um, life expectancy in this country has rolled over. Uh, what I mean by rolled over, um, our kids are the first generation that cannot expect to live as long as their parents. That is, I have a granddaughter, she just turned one. Her life expectancy is less than that of my son's. This is what I mean by rolled over. Life expectancy in the United States is no longer growing, and it's not COVID. This is pre-COVID data. It is now going down. Why? We're not smoking as much, we're exercising more. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, we're eating better. Why is it going down? Well, the Surgeon General of the United States is very concerned about health misinformation. And COVID has activated this entire fact-checking misinformation campaign because there is this burgeoning sort of revolution of personal responsibility and do your own research, a phrase that's being ridiculed in social media right now. People thinking that I want to take responsibility for my own health are sharing information, sharing experiences, sharing what worked for them. And the Surgeon General of the United States doesn't like it. They've published a pamphlet and it says confronting health misinformation. It's advising doctors and professionals and citizens on how to tamp down on all that information sharing and this, this bottom-up revolution in what's working in health. So I thought I should examine the Surgeon General's recommendations and see if that's working. If healthcare, if sorry, if life expectancy has rolled over and is now shrinking, it makes sense for us to examine what are people doing differently. At, just as an example, one of the things that the Surgeon General recommends is that you wear a hat and sunglasses and protective clothing. You seek shade. I'm reading this off the notes. I've copied it right out of their pamphlet. Use a broad spectrum sunscreen. Does this sound familiar? Everybody knows you should have a hat. You should slather up with sunscreen. Skin cancer is an extremely prevalent, like deadly melanoma. You don't want any of that stuff. Cover yourself in zinc oxide or whatever else it is so you don't get a sunburn. That's the conventional wisdom and it's backed by the institutional messaging. 
But how many people know that 80% of the American population is deficient in vitamin D? I mean, is that a message that you're getting? And what happens when you're deficient in vitamin D? One of the first things that happens is you're more vulnerable to respiratory illnesses. This is why flu occurs in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And some people say, well, it's because we're shut up inside. You know, uh, most people I know in New Hampshire are not all shut up inside in the winter, but, but there might be something to that. When they run the studies, it is not being shut up inside. It is not the inside door room temperature. It is the lack of vitamin D. It is the 80% of us that are deficient in vitamin D that become more vulnerable to respiratory ill. It's not just rickets, like we were taught when we were kids. Drink your milk, because they put vitamin D in that milk so you don't get rickets. It's not just bone health, although it is bone health. The vitamin D deficiency also correlates with osteoporosis. It's respiratory illnesses. And when you get the message about SPF 15, you get the message about the dangers of tanning beds, and you get the message about wear a hat, nobody gives you the message of, and you should also be supplementing with 10,000 individual units of vitamin D a day because you're deficient. And your deficiency is leaving you open to other illnesses, infectious illnesses, uh, bone diseases, and other uh, diseases of this deficiency. So should we question the Surgeon General and the uh, the Health and Human Services, who says, slather on the sunscreen and wear a hat? Because unless you live in Phoenix, Arizona, as I do, nine months out of the year, there isn't even enough sunshine to create vitamin D. And what doesn't make sense to me is how you could get a burn when you don't even have enough vitamin D to keep your body alive. Now, I live in Phoenix, and in the winter, it's still hard to get enough sunshine to make vitamin D. So I do supplement, and this has been working for me as far as I can tell, great. I've been tested for COVID nine times. I have to be tested because I work at a university, in a classroom, on a campus, and they require this of me. In addition to the PCR tests that uh, ASU developed, and they run off of saliva, I've taken two antibody tests just to see if I have natural immunity. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed for natural immunity but I can't catch this contagious disease. I'm saying, I'm at the point where you tell me what doorknob to lick and I will <laughs> self-infect. And it may be that natural immunity doesn't come just from having recovered from the infection. We all have an immune system. Most of us, because we're vitamin D deficient, have a deficient immune system. When you supplement with vitamin D and you strengthen your immune system, it may be that natural immunity occurs because you have an immune system, not just because you have antibodies in recovery. So I'm already skeptical of the Surgeon General and Health and Human Services because I no longer believe what they say about vitamin D. What else is my government telling me? Uh, these are the dietary guidelines for Americans that are coming from the USDA, Department of Health and Human Services. What do they tell you? I know you've heard this. Um, eat a variety of vegetables. What could be wrong with that? Eat fruits, especially whole fruits. This all sounds good. We've been told this since, I don't know, since we were young children. Eat the grains, have fat-free or low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and any fortified soy beverages. Does this sound right to you? I don't know. Like, I was on board with the fruits and vegetables. It sort of makes sense. Now we're talking about the fat-free dairy and the fortified soy vegetables. I don't remember my mother titrating soy vegetables in the or beverages in the kitchen. Should we be drinking skim milk or whole milk? When my son was diagnosed with diabetes, he was six years old. We moved to New Hampshire shortly afterwards. And because I was concerned about his blood sugar levels, because I was monitoring his blood sugar and his insulin demand every day, his pancreas, the islet cells in the pancreas had shut down. He wasn't making insulin anymore. And it was my responsibility to keep him alive and healthy. I got really interested in the Atkins diet. One of the things that Dr. Atkins said is low carb for weight loss. But I was interested in low carb for insulin demand, for management of his blood sugar. Atkins said heavy cream is healthier than skim milk because skim milk has a lot of lactose and a lot of carbs. Heavy cream, very few carbs. So I read this part and I'm suspect. Eat a variety of, for, of protein foods, they say, seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, beans, peas, nuts, soy products, and oils. I don't buy it anymore. I th I'm skeptical of this advice. But the question is, are Americans taking it? And sure enough, the Department of Health and Human Services has a report card. It's called Adherence of the US Population Ages Two and Older to the Dietary Guidelines. 
They monitor what people eat, and they say, how's America doing? In aggregate, according to the report card from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, we've improved every year from 1999 to 2010 when they stopped keeping track. Every single year, we get better in our diet. You think about some of the changes that have been made, um, whether it's fast food, or we know that we eat out too much, we know we eat too many processed foods. But some of these companies have been responsive to some of the criticisms. Uh, you can buy an apple at McDonald's. When I was a kid, you couldn't get an apple. There was no such thing as a salad at McDonald's. That's not what McDonald's was for. On the whole, dietary conformance with these guidelines has been improving. On the whole, the exercise report card has been improving as well. And if we are eating better and exercising more, why are we dying faster in the United States? The hypothesis that I'm putting forth to you is that the guidelines are wrong. The closer we follow them, the sooner we die. And this means we can't trust what Health and Human Services is saying, and we've got to figure this out for ourselves. This is where I'm asking you to suspend some of the conventional wisdom, the belief in everything you've been told, and open your mind up to the fact of I'm going to say fact, I'm challenging you with this, that the opposite of everything you've been told is the right way to live. So let's take a look at this. This is a new book by Benjamin Bickman. He's a doctor of philosophy, as I am, but not an engineer. He's in Utah, and he wrote a book called Why We Get Sick. This is, uh, came out last year. Bickman's thesis is insulin resistance. This is why we get sick. Insulin transports glucose from your bloodstream into your cells so you can metabolize it. Insulin resistance is not what my son has because his body doesn't make insulin. Insulin resistance is when the cells become resistant to enter the glucose entering in. Okay, so how does this work? There's insulin in the bloodstream which grabs the glucose, transport it across the cell membrane where it can get into the cell. Once the glucose is inside the cell, it must, re must reach the mitochondria. Mitochondria are separate organelles. They are almost like different living organisms. They have their own DNA. And you can have thousands of them within a single cell in your body. And their purpose is to metabolize, provide the energy. The glucose must find its way to the mitochondria where the mitochondria process it into electrons. You run on electricity, whether you know it or not. The mitochondria will break down the glucose, produce the electrons that you need to um, regulate your body temperature, to move your muscles, to think all of your thoughts, to process everything that's going on in your brain. What's happening is you eat glucose and fats primarily, but also proteins and ketones provide energy. Insulin's job. And this is all insulin does, as far as I know, is move glucose into the cell where it can be metabolized. <laughs> insulin resistance is when it takes more and more insulin to move that glucose across the cell membrane inside to where the mitochondria can find it. Ben Bickman's book says, insulin resistance is present in over two-thirds of adult Americans. It's a precursor to type 2 diabetes, and eight out of the 10 leading causes of death derive from insulin resistance. These age-related diseases are predicted by insulin resistance. Heart disease, insulin resistance. Alzheimer's, insulin resistance. The, uh, these eight of the 10 leading causes of death all correlate, even if we don't know the exact mechanism, with insulin resistance. So how do we age? We age because our metabolism breaks down. And Bickman says, we age, be, our metabolism breaks down because we eat too many carbohydrates and we have too little experience with fasting. The data here is uh, very convincing. When you have what's called high insulin sensitivity, you process glucose rapidly, your mitochondria are healthy, and you stay younger longer. Um, one of the most reliable ways to extend the life of a laboratory rat. It's fasting, it's calorie restriction. This is all we really know about life extension in mammals. Reducing the number of calories, 
increases the lifespan in the laboratory. And there's some good epidemiological evidence with humans, although we haven't run like the same experiments. The good thing about rats is they don't live very long, and so you can get rapid results in the lab. But there's some good epidemiological results with humans that say calorie restriction will extend life. Now, why would that be? Tie it back to Bickman's idea on insulin resistance. When you fast, when your calories are restricted, you're not spiking your glucose, you're not creating the insulin resistance around your cells. So calorie restriction and insulin resistance, sorry, calorie restriction is one of the remedies for insulin resistance, which we found in human beings who fast or go low carb. But it turns out it's not just calorie restriction. Another myth, another misinformation is this model of calories in, calories out. That if you want to lose weight, you've got to restrict your calories. Now, thermodynamically, for most people, this makes a lot of sense. In practice, why doesn't it work? If we understood calories in, calories out, and we're reading package labels, and we get the little meters that tell us how many steps we have and how many calories we're burning, it seems like losing weight ought to be simple. But it's not simple because we are complex. We are not machines. We're not automobile engines. Food is not fuel. It's not like gasoline, where you get to drive as far as the mileage will take you, kind of the size of the tank. We are complex people. And the calories in, calories out hypothesis, it avoids, it obscures the complexity of our metabolism and our hormone balance. It's not just calories in, calories out. The quality of those calories really counts. For me, when I was measuring my son's blood glucose, and this is, you know, he's six, he's seven years old, he still wants to have the cupcake, he still wants to have the treat. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? He'd eat an Oreo, and I would watch his blood sugar go from like 110 to 180. And then I'm looking at his younger sister, and I'm going, if this is what happens to my son with one Oreo cookie, what's happening to my daughter? And then I started looking at me. I was 249 pounds at the time. I'm 210 now, so I've lost some weight and I've kept most of it off. Oreos didn't show up in our house anymore because it's not just the calories, it's the quality of the calories that counts. There's more to it than insulin resistance. I got a photo of Dean Hall. Uh, Dean is a real early adopter customer of us, ours. He's a, um, he's a former psychotherapist. He's up in Oregon. He lost his wife to brain cancer. He was diagnosed with uh, leukemia and a lymphoma. And he had these huge nodes, it's swollen lymph nodes. I mean, his cancer was screaming at you, obvious. And he was already experiencing the grief of his wife's death when he went to his doctor and he said, Doc, I can't believe this is happening to me, to me, after I'd already lost my wife and I can't go out quiet. I want to do something for cancer patients and cancer survivors before I die because he was inoperable and untreatable. His cancer was a death sentence. Doc said, what do you want to do? Dean said, I want to go back to where my people were, my ancestors in Ireland. I want to swim, he's a swimmer, I want to swim the entire length of the Shannon River and I want to do it to inspire other cancer patients. Doc said, I don't know. I mean, you got nothing to lose, so you're welcome to try. Dean said, okay, I'm going to try. He put on his web suit and um, in Oregon, he lives near the Williamette River. He's swimming the Williamette River and he's doing this every day. He's got nothing else to do in his life. His daughter goes out there with a canoe and she follows him along and takes some pictures. He swam the entire length of the Williamette River. He's the only person who's ever done it. And he went back to his doctor several months later and he says, I want you to give me the thumbs up so I can go to Ireland and I can swim this Shannon River. Am I okay? The doctor says, where did your cancer go? He's like, you tell me, doc. The doctor says, if I didn't do your original diagnosis myself, I would have said it was a false result. Dean calls us up and he says, Tom, I want to get one of your forges. I believe that cold water swimming cured my cancer. And I'm like, uh, I'm happy. I mean, we're going to send you a forge, Dean, but, uh, you know, cure for cancer. So I went to the library. What do cancer cells metabolize? Glucose. 80% of cancer cells obligate glucose. They cannot metabolize on anything else. When you cut the glucose down in your bloodstream, you starve the cancer cells. All right, that's good. Turns out what kills cancer? 
ketones. Now I knew about ketosis from my son's diabetes. When I took him to the emergency room, he was in what's called ketoacidosis. Because he doesn't produce insulin, he was peeing it all out, it stayed in his bloodstream, it never entered his cells, and his cells had to stay alive off of something else, and that was ketones. But he produced so many ketones that it was beginning to change the pH of his blood. He was hours away from a coma. So I knew about ketones when I was reading uh, Seafried's book and Travis Christopherson's book on the metabolic theory of cancer. And here I didn't believe Dean for crap. And he's a customer until I went to the library and I started reading about his case. How do you beat Dean's cancer? You starve it with glucose and you kill it with ketones, which is exactly what you would expect would happen when you get into the cold Williamette River and you swim all day. Now most people are not going to, I mean with a cancer diagnosis or not, they're not going to swim the Williamette River. What can they do? They can cut down their carbs, they can get some deliberate cold exposure. The fastest way to produce ketones endogenously inside your body is cold exposure. It happens almost instantly. 30 seconds after you get into the ice water, boom, ketones start showing up in your body. Those ketones are the body's natural chemotherapy. My opinion of Dean Hall changed considerably. We wrote an article about him, we did the before and after pictures, we talked about the metabolic theory of cancer, and it doesn't cure all cancers. But there's some really good science about using ketosis. Again, this is a fasting or a low carb state. The science hasn't done deliberate cold exposure yet. But some really good articles about using ketosis in conjunction with chemotherapy and other therapies. And everyone, every cancer patient in the study that uses ketosis gets better faster, which is extraordinary. We're on to something. What we've learned from Department of Health and Human Services, the Surgeon General, from the FDA, from the USDA, is not keeping us well longer. We are going to have to relearn from people like Dean. So how does it work? I said, and this is the most speculative part, I said insulin resistance correlates with all of these age-related diseases. And Ben Bickman's book is very convincing on us, but he doesn't explain why do we become insulin resistant. To get that, I had to read more books about mitochondria. These are the organelles inside your cell that have their own DNA. Well, I was taught as a kid that the DNA inside the nucleus of my cell, it gives me the hair color, it gives me my height, it gives me my eye color, I inherited from my parents, and this is what governs my features. I've talked to other people, people who are as heavy or heavier than I were. They say, well, you know, I can't really lose weight because, you know, I have kind of a genetic or I have a thyroid or I have the whatever. It turns out mitochondria have their own DNA. They are inherited only from the mother. The way this inheritance works, it is in parallel to the DNA that are inside your nucleus, but your father has nothing to do with it. They come only from your mother, which makes them really interesting. They're almost like a separate organism that lives inside your body. And there is nothing more dense with mitochondria than brown fat. Two types of fat. The white fat, which I have all around here, but there's also brown fat. And brown fat exists mostly between the shoulder blades, around the collarbones, and around the heart. The only purpose of brown fat is this metabolic regulation. It talks to the thyroid. The thyroid and the brown fat work together to stabilize one another, and it produces heat. So when I go into the forge, we'll do it after this talk, I'll show you how, it activates my brown fat. The brown fat begins burning glucose, clearing it out of my bloodstream, burning the lipids that are stored in my white fat just to produce heat. And it's the mitochondria in the brown fat that do this. So I had to read these books about mitochondria to understand why would we become insulin resistant. The mitochondria inside the cell process all of the energy of the cell. And remember that you run on electricity. When you eat, when your glucose is processed, it's broken down in a way that produces electrons. When there's too much glucose for the mitochondria to process, it's like a spark going off in the mitochondria. That spark is called free radical formation. And the free radicals can damage the mitochondrial DNA. When your mitochondrial DNA are damaged, you get old. You get metabolically old, you get biologically old, you get what appears to be chronologically old. The faster you hurt your mitochondria, the faster you age. Now you can build new mitochondria, your body has selection mechanisms for reproducing mitochondria, and it chooses the best mitochondria, the ones with the DNA that are most intact. And it says, I want those, and I'll reproduce from those. And this is partly why 
my friend on Twitter thinks there's no biological, there's no theoretical limit to how old we can live. How do you produce new mitochondria? Exercise and cold exposure. Accelerate the production, the selection, the production of new mitochondria. So mitochondria health is one of the critical pillars of um, longevity that we rarely talk about. Why would we become insulin resistant when too much glucose enters the cell and reaches the mitochondria? It creates free radicals that damage the mitochondria, which will kill you. Your body is, and this is the most speculative part, your body's making a choice when you eat too many carbs without the exercise or the cold exposure to burn them all off. The cells say, keep that glucose in the bloodstream. The mitochondria isn't ready for it yet. We don't have a demand for it yet. We're not able to metabolize it into the white fat cells fast enough. Keep it in the bloodstream for now. It's very damaging in the bloodstream. My son is at risk for blindness because high blood glucose ruptures the blood vessels in his eyes. He's at risk for amputation because the capillaries and the extremities are the first ones to rupture. It's very damaging to have excess blood glucose levels. And you know what's even worse? Excess blood, uh, sorry, excess glucose in your mitochondria because that produces free radicals that will kill you faster. Why do we become insulin resistant? This is our body trying to protect us against our own stupid choices. But it didn't feel stupid when I was like, pumpkin brulee cheesecake <laughs> with pomegranate and caramel. I mean, it felt good. Meanwhile, my body is saying, you better get in a porch, get in the gym, or, we're not letting this glucose anywhere near the mitochondria. We're gonna keep it in your bloodstream for hours until your mitochondria are ready for it. We become insulin resistant as a way of defending the critical component of our body that controls aging, and it is the mitochondria. So how are we gonna take better care of our mitochondria? How are we gonna to get to that point where we go meet Patrick Porter at some tiny little conference with a bunch of biohackers that are dying to meet one another and he says, congratulations, I can't even sell you my $450 device in good conscience because you're not ripped, because you're not some kind of male biohacking model, but your brain is working great. How do we do that? Exercise. Exercise is terrific. And this is an area where, yes, Americans have been improving, but in particular, it's the weightlifting, what's called resistance exercise. From what I read, that is most helpful. And you need way less of it than you really think. You don't have to be at the gym every day for 75 minutes. Now the aesthetic is something else. You wanna get ripped, maybe you do, but not for longevity. You do, and I forget what it is, but this is my friend, he's like 75 minutes a day, he looks great. He's very healthy, he can do 11 chin-ups. I'm embarrassed because he does 11 without breaking a sweat. I go up to three and three quarters. He's 66 years old. So I'm like, well, you know, give me another 10 years, I'll probably get up to 11 chin-ups too. Because he's been <coughs> aging in reverse like I have. And what you are missing, even in New Hampshire, is the cold exposure that your ancient ancestors had on a seasonal basis. We're in a beautifully comfortable room. We live air conditioned, climate controlled lives. And as a consequence, especially in Phoenix, Arizona, we lose all the brown fat. When we lose the brown fat, we lose the cells in our body that are most densely packed with mitochondria. We lose the cells in our body that regulate our thyroid, that regulates our metabolism. So what am I recommending? What worked for me is getting in the cold. I do it every day, two to four minutes a day, sometimes twice, especially in Phoenix in the summertime. I add cold exposure to my life because my ancient ancestors, you know, the pilgrims that landed on Plymouth Rock, they were cold. And you can say, but half of them died. You know, they didn't even know what to eat. And the, once they got a chance, if they could have had central air, they would have taken it. And so our body says the same thing. It says, be comfortable. Turn up the heater in your car. Get the seats that have the little electrodes in them that make your butt feel warm. Everything about our evolutionary biology says, seek that comfort that our ancestors didn't have. And it's killing us. We need to replace some of the discomfort that our ancestors hated and put it back in our lives intentionally. 
This is why we call it deliberate cold exposure. Not accidental cold exposure, that can lead to hypothermia, but deliberate cold exposure where you get in and out of the forge of your own volition to create the hormetic stress, the stress that leaves you stronger, intentionally leaving your comfort zone so that you can go about the rest of your life healthier, happier.